afternoon. I'm Rachel Kinderdine, Community Manager at the Los Angeles World Affairs Council and Town Hall. It is my pleasure to welcome you to today's program in partnership with the British Consulate General, Roadmap to LA 2028, Fostering Partnership for Zero Emission Transportation and the Clean Energy Transition. Today's panel will be led by His Majesty's Consul General Emily Cloak, British Consul General Los Angeles. The conversation will focus on local, regional, and international efforts to accelerate transportation electrification and zero emission goods movement across the Los Angeles region in preparation for the 2028 Olympic and Paralympic Games. We are joined by an expert panel today, including Nancy Sutley, Los Angeles Deputy Mayor of Energy and Sustainability, Michelle Kinman, Senior Vice President of the Los Angeles Clean Tech Incubator, and Mike Backstrom, Southern California Edison Vice President of Regulatory Affairs. We at the LA World Affairs Council and Town Hall want to thank the British Consulate General Los Angeles for their partnership on this program, and we hope you enjoy today's conversation. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Welcome, Welcome to, to the, the British, British residents in Los Angeles for what promises, promises to be an excellent discussion on the roadmap to LA 2028, fostering partnership for zero emission transportation and the clean energy transition. My name is Emily Cloak. I am the British Consul General, and I'd like to welcome you all in the room here today at the British residents, as well as online, given the event is being live streamed through our partner, the Los Angeles World Affair Council. Our discussion today will cover local, regional, and international efforts to accelerate transport electrification and zero goods movement across the LA region in preparation for the 2028 Games. A word first on the British Consulate. We in Los Angeles represent the UK and Southern California, Arizona, Nevada, Utah, Hawaii, and the US Pacific territories based in Los Angeles. We're here to strengthen the relationship between the UK and the US from tackling climate change together, strengthening trade and investment, economic links, science and innovation, government to government links, people to people ties, and many other areas, and working together to mitigate the worst effects of climate change to help achieve our net zero goals is at the heart of that work, and we're committed to doing so closely with LA and California. We're proud of the UK's record um, across our efforts to get to net zero. And I'd like to say a little bit about our work in this space. So back in 2021, we were the hosts of COP26 and the UK oversaw the signing of the Glasgow Pact, the first climate agreement with explicit language on the role of nature-based solutions and a global commitment to reduce unabated coal usage. Transport is the largest source of greenhouse gas emissions in both the UK and the US, and a crucial sector to work together uh, to decarbonize our economies uh, by mid-century together. At COP26, the UK and key partners launched the ZEV Declaration, committing countries, states, cities, auto manufacturers, and fleet owners, among others, to ensuring new cars and vans sold a zero emission by 2040 globally, and 2035 in leading markets, and that now has over 220 signatories. Last month, the UK announced our zero emission vehicle mandate, the most ambitious regulatory framework for the switch to EVs in the world. And then locally, um, I'm proud that the UK signed its first ever MOU with a US city with Los Angeles back in 2021 looking at how we could work together on decarbonisation of transport, looking at innovation and wider policy areas. Some recent conversations with the city is how we step up that collaboration in the lead up to LA 2028 Games. And that at a state level, we in the UK are working with the state of California on a memorandum of understanding with a focus on tackling climate change together and also looking at how we really spur economic growth. So a wide of initiatives that we're working on together. That now brings me to the LA 2028 Games, which I think will be an incredibly exciting global event where the eyes of the world will be on LA 
um, and you know we're incredibly excited about it in, in the UK. We're sports sports mad, I think it's fair to say. Uh, but also, it's fantastic that LA has committed to a car-free games, and with it being the third time LA will host the games, uh, the infrastructure in terms of venues have already been built. So, so this panel is a fantastic opportunity to hear from some incredible incredible here today on what the LA region is doing to move uh, to clean energy, transport electrification, building decarbonization and grid resiliency ahead of these games. And the UK, of course, is excited to work with, with you all in that effort. Um, the, London the London 2012 Games uh, was the first to measure its carbon footprint over the entire project term and has introduced also a range of transport modifications to really make sure that the public were um, using public transport as much as possible. So we have quite a good record in that space and are excited to work with you uh, ahead of what promises to be a very exciting global moment. So I'd now like to introduce our panellists. I'm going to let, let them, them do uh, the introducing. So I'd now like to pass my left for our first guest speaker. If you could just introduce yourself and say a little bit about yourself. And we'll move down to the panel and then start with the first questions. Thank you. Absolutely. Well, thank you for uh, the invitation to be here. It's a delight to see all of you today and to be here with my fellow panelists who I have had the pleasure of working with very closely over the past couple of years on the initiatives that we'll talk about today. I'm Michelle Kinman. I'm the Senior Vice President of what is called the Market Transformation Team at the Los Angeles Clean Tech Incubator, or LACI. And just as a quick bit of background for those of you who may not yet have gotten to meet LACI, we're a nonprofit or uh, incubator that is focused on creating an inclusive green economy throughout the Los Angeles region and beyond. We started about 12 years ago initially as an initiative out of the city of Los Angeles under Mayor Villaraigosa's administration and have carried on the initial work um, that we started to do in a number of different fronts and um, began about five years ago to put together public-private partnerships, very much laser focused on accelerating change across sectors um, ahead of the 2028 Olympic Games, using the games as a catalyst to drive forward change that we all know needs to happen, but hopefully can happen more quickly if we're working together rather than in silos. So those two partnerships are our transportation electrification partnership and our clean energy partnership. I'll pass it to Nancy. Oh, there we go. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Council General, for having us here, uh, Nancy Sutley and Deputy Mayor for Energy and Sustainability for the City of Los Angeles. Um, I've been there almost a year, uh, and previous to that, I was the Chief Sustainability Officer at the uh, Los Angeles Department of Water and Power and spent many years in uh, local, state, federal government um, for uh, for, uh, for Mayor Bass, um, you know, she recognizes that uh, one, one of the one of the crises that's confronting the city is the is the climate <laughs> crisis, and how we uh, get to our decarbonization goals uh, to get 100% clean energy in our grid by 2035, uh, and to decarbonize buildings and transportation sector, and to do it in a way that. In a way uh, brings uh, all communities in, especially those um, that have too often been left behind. And where are the opportunities and the economic opportunities in this in this transformation? So, uh, looking across um, the the infrastructure that the city owns, the power grid, the port, the airport, uh, working with with Metro and and other partners, and then. Um, a lot, a lot of, of uh, focus, focus, I think, I think has sort of ramped up in the new year as uh, 2028, which seemed like a long way away, uh, uh, isn't. Um, and, and so uh, working um, regionally, uh, LA as the host city for uh, for the the Olympic Games, uh, the working with the LA 28 uh, Olympic Organizing Committee as as the host city. Uh, working, working with our with partners, partners across the region to make sure that, that uh, our our energy grid and our transportation, transportation networks are, are ready um, so we can put our best face forward in uh, for the games. 
And of course, of course we're, we're no strangers, no strangers to, to hosting international, international events uh, here, here in Los Angeles. And a third time hosting the Olympic Games will also be one of the host cities for the 2026 FIFA World Cup, um, as well as the uh, NBA All-Star Game in 2027. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, and a host of other things. So um, uh, every day is an exciting day in Los Angeles. Thanks. Uh, and I'm, I'm Mike, Mike Baxter, the, the Vice President, President of Regulatory Affairs at Southern California Edison. Edison. Um, much, much like uh, what, what Nancy, Nancy just described, just described um, our, our company has been extremely focused on ensuring that we play a critical role in helping our state uh, achieve its very critical uh, carbon reduction goals and ultimately carbon neutrality by 2045 and have spent a lot of time analyzing the economy-wide solution set that can help us get there most cost-effectively and ensure that we have a really crisp understanding of what the utility back utility work is going to look like uh, in supporting that. We at Southern California Edison serve about a 50,000 square mile service territory in the state of California, which is larger than many multi-state utilities, um, but we're all within the, the borders of California. Um, and as uh, an adjacency to LADWP, um, see the, the forthcoming games as a really critical time to illustrate the progress that we're making in our region. And indeed, a number of the venues will be right within our service territory. Uh, for example, SoFi Stadium is one that we serve directly. And so we have been extremely focused on the long-term achievement of decarbonization uh, because we look at that not only as a critical imperative from a climate perspective, but we also see it as one that is extremely beneficial economically to our region. And even drilling further down for customers who pay our bills, over the long run, when we see the transition take place to more efficient use of electric, uh, electric resources rather than fossil fuels, the total energy cost that we project for our customers is 40% lower by the time we get to 2045 and we've made that transition. So we see that as a really critical thing. When you take gasoline prices out, you take natural gas and, and reduce that and you replace it with the efficient uses of electricity, cleaner and cheaper and better for our region. So we are extremely focused on that and, and excited about the partnerships that we've had. We've worked very closely with Lacey on both the transportation and the clean energy partnerships and looking forward to talking a lot more about that today. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for those wonderful intros and, and Deputy Mayor. I have to say I agree that every day is exciting in Los Angeles, uh, including today uh, and this panel. Uh, so Michelle, you, you mentioned two partnerships that Lacey have, the clean energy and transportation electrification ones. Can you tell us a little bit more about that, what goals they set for Los Angeles, please? Absolutely. Uh, so we started the transportation electrification partnership back in 2018. So as Nancy was alluding to, that seemed like a really long time away to set goals for 2028. It no longer feels very far away. Uh, but we came together with all of our partners, around 25 different partners in the public and private sector, and put together a suite of aggressive targets that we um, felt were necessary to move the LA region forward in our climate and air pollution goals. The overarching goal of the partnership is to further reduce greenhouse gas emissions in LA County, an additional 25% beyond what was already on the books and planned back in September of 2018. So that's a pretty sizable um, overarching goal. And then we did um, some really meticulous work to determine how are we going to achieve that goal in terms of what percentage of vehicles, light, medium, heavy duty need to be electrified to meet that goal? And then how much charging infrastructure do we need to support those vehicles? I won't go through all of the targets for you, but just to give you a sense of the, the types of targets that we set um, on the medium and heavy duty side, we said that we are gonna need 60% uh, of medium duty delivery trucks to be electrified by 2028 here in LA County, and 40% of the short haul trucks that come from the ports to the Inland Empire warehouses to be zero emissions by that same year. So that just gives you a flavor of the types of uh, the scale that we need to get that we, if we're going to be on track to meet our, our local, our regional, and our statewide goals on transportation. And then on the clean energy side, we've only recently launched that partnership and its targets, but the overarching goal for that partnership is that to work across the um, electricity, the building, and the transport sector. So there is, of course, a really key energy transportation nexus uh, piece to all of this and to further reduce GHG emissions an additional 15% across our region. Sorry, by things like, uh, you know, 
building decarbonization efforts, by deploying distributed energy resources, by figuring out how do we have those resources talk to one another under a virtual power plant, and a whole bunch of other really exciting initiatives. But I, I guess I would want to highlight that it's not just about goal setting for us or for our partners, it's using those goals as our North Star for how we work together across sectors. Uh, everyone, everyone who's a part of our partnerships is already doing fantastic work in these spaces, and it's really about creating a space where folks can put aside the day-to-day, -day, the excitement of living in L.A. for a minute, and just roll up our sleeves and together address the problems that are facing all of us as, as sectors, as players in these sectors, and figuring out what could we do that would be innovative and different to advance towards the solutions that we see needed. That's great, and, and I love uh, that, that that focuses on solutions and bringing everyone together around that. Uh, Deputy Mayor, uh, with a with an eye towards LA 2028 in the context, could you tell us a little bit about the different initiatives or policies um, that you're implementing with a view to accelerating the adoption of zero uh, emission vehicles, please? Great, well, thanks. So, uh, yeah, this is something that... Um, is a, is important not just um, as the host of the 2028 Olympic Games, but also uh, many of the other um, policies. And also, you know, we still have the worst air pollution in the nation, and it's largely coming from the transportation sector. Uh, and so we get the double benefit of, of de decarbonizing the transportation sector and uh, improving our air quality. Um, and so, you know, we are... Uh, we, are we are trying, trying to, to, you know, meet, meet the moment, moment that's upon, that's upon us and will be upon us um, over the next, you know, the next more than a decade. So uh, right, right now, about 25% um, of the vehicles, new vehicles being sold in California are are electric vehicles. Um, the the state is uh, the regulation that um, will ban the sale of internal combustion engine vehicles in 2035. Uh, so we have to be we have to be ready. Um, We've got about uh, over 27,000 publicly available charging ports in the city of Los Angeles. Um, uh, many of those on, you know, available to the public or in garages. Um, but still, many people um, who can plug in at home. Um, I do, and my little whatever uh, socket in my uh, garage. So leave my car charging overnight. Um, so we're really trying to be prepared for that. Uh, uh, and, and looking, looking at all, all the tools that the city has to help um, to accelerate the deployment of, of chargers, uh, largely through um, uh, financial incentives to the Department of Water and Power, uh, where, where uh, they have a uh, EV charger rebate program that basically covers the cost of a, a level two charger um, and some of the installation as well as uh, uh, incentives for um, DC fast chargers um, looking also at um, you know what what infrastructure the city can help to deploy as well so uh, so Bureau of street lighting for example on the street lights is installed as a goal to install about 900 electric vehicle chargers on street lights and you'll see those around uh, around the city um, and also ensuring that there's access uh, for everyone who wants to uh, access, access uh, zero, zero emissions, emissions. Uh, uh, mobility, mobility, whether it's through um, uh, helping to uh, host a electric vehicle charge pressure program, the Blue LA program, uh, that uh, we got some funding from the Air Resources Board to get started and looking at an expansion of that program, which is targeted towards uh, low income and disadvantaged communities offering um, elect, uh, used EV electric car, used EV rebates uh, through the Department of Water and Power. Uh, they've just increased those. And really looking at focusing uh, on areas of the city that um, that are kind of EV charging deserts. So if you look at a, a map of where all the EV chargers are in Los Angeles, there are some, um, unfortunately, some very blank areas. Uh, and we really have to I uh, have to try to address that. And the last two things I just mentioned is, you know, it's not only about uh, owning a car, so we're making investments uh, in our transit systems. Um, I won't point out Heather or Penny from Metro, is just walking in, just one time about transit, uh, through LA Metro as they electrify their uh, their bus fleet, um, as well as building out uh, rail 
uh, light rail and heavy rail uh, to provide this mo mobility option. Op um, uh, LA DOT's dash bus service uh, also is going going electric. And then uh, Michelle mentioned, you know, again, our regional air pollution problem is significant. Uh, the works of Los Angeles and Long Beach are the single largest sources of air pollution in the uh, in the region, and all of the um, equipment at the port, uh, the ships, the um, all the cranes and uh, cargo handling equipment, as well as the trucks, uh, really contribute to our both our smog problem and our uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So, uh, we're really looking at accelerating the deployment of zero emission technology in and around the port. Thanks. Thank you so much, much a range, range of impressive, impressive initiatives there. Mike, Mike could you say a little bit about public-private public partnerships and how you're using those to foster and drive innovation in ZEV technology and infrastructure? Absolutely, and so we view that as a really critical part of achieving success here. There are certain things that we as the utility alone or even with a, a subset of our customers can do, but <laughs> fundamentally to get to the scale we're talking about, it really is has to be a set of partnerships to get there. Michelle mentioned at the start that um, we think about Lacey and a lot of the work we do there is a, a great fostering ground for exactly that type of thing. And, and working on the roadmap together, I think, has helped get us down the path. Um, and we will continue those. But at the same time, we've also been um, taking on a few other um, kind of recent public-private partnerships that have really helped us um, advance some of the electrification rollout we're looking at. I'll probably get into it a little bit later as far as some of the individualized programs that we have, many of which mirror what uh, Nancy was talking about relative to what LADWP and the city have been doing. But uh, in order to advance, uh, for example, heavy-duty electrification, which is one of those spaces that I think was a really nice lead out there about the, what the ports are doing and all of the, the, you know, the shipping activity that we have in our region being a big contributor to our pollution that we need to clean up. Um, we partnered with uh, Schneider Electric and NFI um, to electrify 100 um, heavy-duty vehicles across different uh, areas of their, their work in our region. Um, that was a, you know, kind of a pretty broad undertaking that was uh, known as the California Joint Truck Electric, Joint Electric Truck Scaling Initiative. Um, and so working with them with funding that came from uh, the Air Resources Board at the state level, the Energy Commission, uh, which contributed about close to 50% of the $75 million funding for the project, and we and others um, helped make about for about another $40 million. Uh, we were able to provide the infrastructure and the, the, the site locations and help with the truck conversions for those, uh, those trucks. So that was a really kind of exciting space, places that you learn from, too, as you get into that. Um, you know, yeah, these, these days, days, one of the, uh, I think, other, other critical aspects of potential partnership has to do with how we deal with the supply chain, chain challenge. Um, we may get into that a little bit uh, later as well, in that I think, you know, globally, we've seen supply chain challenge, and especially as, you know, we're ramping up now these infrastructure enhancements that we need to make, competition to get our hands on switch gear, and gear transformers, and so forth is really up there. And, you know, the manufacturing is, is trying to keep up, but we have to get a little bit more creative about how we're going to do that. Uh, um, but, but that, that too, you know, has some avenues. We've, We've also, also done, done some partnerships, partnerships with the Port of Long Beach, exactly along the lines of what uh, Nancy was talking about, about to electrify, electrify cargo handling equipment. equipment. And, and, and there's a lot more need, I think, for a, a number of the, the shipping lanes coming in and out of the Port of Long Beach, where we're looking at opportunities to help scale that further. So we see all of that as, as critically important. And, um, maybe we'll get into a little bit later. We also have a, a DOE proposal uh, jointly with LADWP facilitated through Lacey that's going to help, I think, across the board in facilitating some distributed energy resource uh, scaling, virtual power plant, and also transportation. Thank you so much. I'm going to ask a question of all of you, uh, and that's about how how do, how do you make sure that um, equity and accessibility is at the heart of the initiatives in, in your organization? So uh, I'll start with you, Michelle, and then we'll go down the line. I can give you my mic while I answer the question. Thank you. Uh, well, we could have our whole conversation on this question, of course. Um, I don't think, I think one thing that I always keep in mind is that there's not one transportation solution that fits all Californians. And so it's really about 
identifying a suite of different solutions that can meet people where they're at. And so I think one of the you know foundational principles of doing work that is geared towards equity as an end goal is really to be working from very early stages, from the beginning stages of any project, talking with community teams to find out what they have identified as their own transportation or clean energy needs and challenges. Um, some of the things that we have done over the past couple of years that have been really great learning opportunities for us through the work of the Transportation Electrification Partnership, we deployed a number of pilots uh, with, designed with and implemented with community-based organizations throughout the Los Angeles region to meet some of their transportation challenges. The one I'll note here is that we deployed two different EV car share pilots together with low-income communities at sort of the geographic extremes of the city of Los Angeles, one in, up in Pacoima and one down in San Pedro, right next to the port of Los Angeles. We did that during the pandemic, so that pro pro it provided its own set of challenges with that timing just in terms of community outreach, but they both proved to differing degrees and in different ways to be successful pilots uh, that were very much utilized by the community members. And the one the ones down in San Pedro we're still doing today, that is specifically geared towards the residents of an affordable housing community project. And that has been so successful that we've actually used that as the model to build out statewide and federal legislation that if passed would create programs to fund both the deployment of EV chargers as well as the deployment of electric vehicles with housing complexes across the country uh, to you know serve those populations. Um, so I think that is part of what we're always thinking about is sort of that balance of making sure that we are responding to and working with local communities on very specific projects, but then always keeping in mind what lessons can we extract and apply back towards the larger policy um, uh, system so that we can affect change on a, a wider scale throughout the region. So much more we could say, but I will pass it on to my fellow panelists. Yeah, you know, it, 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 this is uh, uh, you know an, an important important, important focus. focus. Uh, uh, Los Angeles uh, uh, has the you know the reality is that so many of our communities face real challenges and are overburdened by pollution as well as other um, you know other harms. Um, more than I think fifty percent of our census tracts have high Cal Enviro's green scores. So. You know, which is just a measure of, of, of um, you know, the challenge that a lot of communities face. So, you know, we talked about a couple of things, our EV car share program, um, Blue LA, uh, focused in low income areas, used um, EV uh, rebates. Um, but uh, I'd mention a, a couple of other things that uh, uh, really try to focus on on equity. One is work, working uh, with our friends with the LAUSD to help them as they look at uh, electrifying their uh, bus fleets and, and providing charge charging uh, infrastructure at schools, um, looking at those opportunities also throughout the city and uh, things like parking lots, like city-owned libraries and stations, uh, really trying to make sure that we're filling in some of the gaps that currently exist um, in EV charging infrastructure. Um, and again, recognizing that not everybody is going to uh, own a car, um, but they should all, everybody should have access to zero emission transportation. Uh, so that's why our transit systems are, are so important in uh, helping, uh, helping deliver on that. Um, at the sort of uh, strategic level, uh, uh, the Department of Water and Power um, did, the, uh, did a big study a few years ago looking at what it takes to get to 100% clean energy in the city. Uh, it's called LA 100. Um, and, and that um, helped to you know, shed light on scenarios and how, you know, what are the investments that were necessary to get to 100% clean energy. But the, but the question that came, kind of came out of that is, like, how do we make sure that every Angelino um, benefits from this transition to... Uh, to, clean to clean energy and to clean, clean transportation. And so, uh, just um, last, last fall, uh, uh, DWP completed its LA 100 Equity Strategies uh, uh, report um, and studied uh, with the help of the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, UCLA, and others, uh, and really looking at the strategies that would help to, um, you know, help to ensure that uh, these, these benefits, benefits of, of clean energy and clean transportation reach everyone. And so out of that, uh, really focusing, uh, focus 
making sure that we're focusing programs on places where um, there isn't currently access to to zero emission transportation. Uh, and and in some cases, some BP will go in and put the chargers in and run the chargers themselves. Um, for example, uh, DWP has a customer service center on Crenshaw Boulevard um, that uh, in the parking lot, a bunch of EV chargers that are available to the public. Um, they are very busy. Uh, and also did something similar in Van Nuys. So really trying to um, look for those opportunities. And the last thing I'd say is, you know, you can't emphasize enough how important the ports uh, and the goods movement and the impacts on uh, uh, communities facing a disproportionate burden of the environmental harm. So getting our ports cleaned up, getting the trucks cleaned up, um, you know, in a sense, our communities um, bear the burden of, um, you know, the, the goods and services that come in from, you know, across the Pacific and go all around the country, um, but we get the pollution. Yeah, and, and I'll just add a little bit to that because I think it really covered the, the area well. When we think about our, our role as an infrastructure provider, we, uh, from a service territory standpoint, we have nearly 40% of our customers that reside in a disadvantaged, disadvantaged community, so, so affected, affected by, by pollution by and low income uh, challenges simultaneously in ways that, you know, in, in historically have not led to the kinds of energy policies that have helped to aid these communities. And so knowing that and also knowing that in, in thinking about the deployment of the solution set here for transportation um, is really important for us to focus on ensuring that while we might see lower utilization initially in, in areas where it takes longer to bring the vehicles in or get to that the right price point, right, we want to have the infrastructure in place so that you know people can have confidence to say, I want to make that change and feel good about the ability to charge my car and, and be able to do so safely and at, at you know, prices that I can understand. And so we have two infrastructure programs, um, large ones under our suite known as Charge Ready, that go to light duty and medium and heavy duty. In each of those uh, programs, which are targeting, you know, over 40,000 electric vehicle ports in our service area, that we have a, a, an objective that 50% of that deployment will be in disadvantaged communities across our territory. And in our progress to date, we're actually running ahead of that. Um, so we're very, very proud of that, and it will be continue to be a focus for us. Likewise, um, there's the infrastructure component, but also how do we help uh, make sure people can get into the vehicles? Similar to what Nancy mentioned earlier, we have a, a used EV rebate program. Um, it's a $1,000 rebate for any used EV purchase, and for people who qualify at uh, income qualified thresholds, it's a $4,000 EV credit. Uh, that's in addition to the federal credits that are now in place uh, on, on the tax credit side of things. So helping very much to try to address that affordability challenge and locationally uh, be able to support it. Finally, as I mentioned, we, you know, we think a lot about just universally, how do we look at the cost picture for customers? If you're not an early adopter, but there's costs coming into the system um, to help make this transition happen, how do we ensure that rates for our customers who are most economically challenged are going to be um, you know, the, you know, at an affordable level in the near and long term? We have, of course, uh, income qualified rates that help to address that. We're also looking at rate structure design that helps to to kind of flatten out the way that, that rates have been historically charged that will bring that the volume metric or the, the, the changing uh, part of the rate down to a more stable level. Um, and we see uh, through that a reduction in energy rates for all of our income qualified customers under the program that we currently have pending in front of the Public Utilities Commission. Thank you very much. It's great to hear that equity and accessibility is at the heart of all of your work. Thank you. Um, Deputy Mayor, I'm going to come back to you. Could you say a little bit about how the work you're doing in LA fits into the wide the statewide transition to electric vehicles ahead of the 2035 ban on the internal combustion engines, please? We'll do, we'll do some mic exchanges uh, for the text. Uh, <laughs> okay. Nice. Let's see. Um, yeah. So, well, you know, uh, sometimes uh, when we try to uh, kind of adjust uh, 
uh, figure out what our share of statewide goals are. And we, about 10% of the hemp population lives here in the city of Los Angeles. So like we take on 10% of everything. Uh, so, you know, we know that, um, you know, one of the challenges I think California is gonna face in this transition is really making sure that there's enough charging infrastructure uh, and a charging infrastructure apparently that works. Um, yeah, uh, according to the LA Times, Times this morning, this morning um, uh, but, but um, you know, yeah, really, really trying, trying to uh, to ensure, um, um, and we, we realize also that we're we're not just a state state city, city, we're a regional we're hub, hub, and, and so, so people, people are coming in and out of, of Los Angeles to, to work, um, you know, to uh, use our airport, for example, so uh, uh, LAX is um, in the middle of, uh, Hopefully soon, completing a, a big modernization uh, project. Uh, it was originally scheduled um, to be done by so that we could host the 2024. Again, we got a few more extra years, but they are working uh, hard to get that done. So um, if you've been to LAX recently, you've seen the, the people movers is uh, pretty close to being done. Uh, but also, they built a new uh, consolidated rental car facility that has. Uh, spaces, spaces for uh, that uh, for electric, electric vehicles, vehicles um, that can be rented. rented. So really trying, trying to look, look uh, comprehensively, comprehensively at the ways, ways that the city can help to support um, this gen transition, transition uh, to, 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 to to zero emissions uh, transportation. transportation. So, so um, um, you know, so I, think I think there's there's there's, uh, uh, there's, there's lots of there's lots of opportunities and lots of ways that you know, we can continue to, to work with our partners, uh, with, whether it's transit agencies, whether it's a school district, whether it's others to um, to help do this. And, you know, one thing advantage a little bit uh, that the DWP has over in Southern California Edison is we're all part of, you know, we're all part of the city. And so we can work with our, um, with other departments, um, to uh, yeah, hopefully, hopefully make sure that things, things can get, get done get quickly. quickly. Uh, yeah. Some not always not the easiest, easiest thing to do, do um, uh, but, but really uh, take, uh, take on, on these goals, goals as a city, city and not just, just uh, uh, kind of piecemeal them. Thank you. Yeah. On, on that challenge of having, having enough charging, charging infrastructure, I think we've covered it a little bit over level conversation, but Mike, do you want to add any more on how you're meeting that challenge and thinking about it as well? Absolutely, happy to. And, and, and that does, does kind of connect, connect to kind of both ends of the infrastructure. You've got, you've got the the EV chargers, chargers themselves and kind of that from the meter forward infrastructure that we've been talking about. And then you've got the utility side infrastructure as well, both of which present, um, you know, opportunity and a lot of challenge when we're talking about the scale of transformation, the speed of transformation that we need to see. Um, so we're focused on both ends of the equation. I mentioned we have the, the Charge Ready programs, which under which the utility is paying the cost of all of the the distribution service upgrade that a customer may need, and then providing a certain amount of rebate for the chargers themselves for our customers who are using that. On our light duty program, we have a 30,000 port sized program. Right now we've got 1,500 of those already deployed and reservations that would get us up to about another uh, 15,000 um, kind of down that, that journey. And on the medium and heavy duty side, similarly, we've got 60 sites deployed and another 200 in our pipeline, um, which all have significant impact on the, the electric distribution system. And so as we've been thinking about this and ways that we can help do that, there's the programs themselves. Then we're thinking about, well, how do we make sure that the power is there and ready when these systems are ready? And, and so, so we've done a couple of things there. there. One, One is we have an initiative known as our power service availability program, program under which we look at um, the speed by which a customer may need the site up and energized. And if our system needs additional upgrades that might take a little bit longer, we look at temporary solutions where we can bring in a mobile battery unit or we can find ways to power up to a certain level and get things going rather than waiting for the entire site to be ready. Um, because it's important to get these these started. So we've got those efforts in flight now with some additional proposals with our regulators around how we can expand that and put more funding to it so we have more of those temporary solutions. Then in the long run, it's about how we build out the distribution system. When we look down the road, you know, the next 10 years and 20 years out, we see growth on our system that is 10 times the rate of build out on our distribution system that we've had historically. 
So when you're talking about that kind of a, a move and four times up at the transmission uh, level to support all of the clean energy and all of the solution sets on both sides of the meter. But to do that, we have to be able to build in a proactive way. So we have, for the first time, um, I've been at the company 20 years, the first time I've seen us do this, we brought forth a proposal to our regulator that is uh, anticipating that load development, looking at the, the state's projections, what we understand from our customers, what kinds of projections we have coming forward and saying that by the time we get to 2030, we know we're gonna need to upgrade our system in this way. And we cannot wait until the year before that to get the approval to do it because these projects take multiple years to get there. So what we do is we, we've scaled our system and looked at you know tran uh, transportation routes coming in and out of the port, some of the heavy shipping routes, some of the heavier uh, um, uh, regular transportation routes and saying, we know we're gonna need to upgrade substations here. We know we're gonna need to do this. So we have put a, we call a TE grid readiness plan in front of our, our regulator that would be an investment plan between 2025 to 2028 to grow in this way, working ahead of some of the load. Some may come sooner, so we need to be ready for that too. It's a billion-dollar investment plan. But the reason that that is so important is when that is there and able to ensure that the adoption comes forward, it comes back around to the point I made earlier that as we see more of that efficient usage of our system, that actually drives the rates down because we have that you know kind of more happening on the system at the time that is most useful. So we look very, very carefully at those kinds of things. And what is so critical is that as we have our customers in the region making these transit transition plans, knowing what they look like, the sooner they're in touch with us, the sooner we can talk about what their needs look like, the better that we can plan for it, be ahead of it, and make sure the system is ready. And then to Nancy's point, work in coordination with cities and counties around the permitting that needs to happen and the approvals so that all these pieces get into place. We've got a lot of, of um, processes that were built decades ago that were ripe for the way that they worked and the pace in which uh, the growth of demand happened then. This is changing dramatically and we have to change the processes around that. Thank you. Um, so for anyone that's joined the live stream uh, recently, we are in the British residence in Los Angeles. Um, and with a nod to that, the fact there are quite a few Brits in the room and LA is the third largest consular corps in the world. I would like to ask each of you, how can international partners like the UK best work with you and your priorities? Uh, starting with Michelle. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and we were lucky enough to have uh, London Mayor Sadiq Khan here, what was it, a year and a half ago, two years, now I've lost track, and he visited uh, Lacey when he was here, and we had a, a great opportunity to showcase for him some of the, of the startup innovations that we had at the time in our cohort, and that was just really lovely, and I share that. Um, because I think that really brought home for me the importance of just continuing to share learnings on the innovation side with one another. And so I think that can take many, many different forms. One of the things that we have coming up in the near term is that Lacey and our Transportation Electrification Partnership is planning to take a study tour to Europe next uh, September and intend on visiting London during that time. So we'd love to talk with all of you more about who we must absolutely meet and the kinds of things that we need to see. But to have that firsthand uh, opportunity to meet with peers, to discuss the real challenges and some of the solutions that we're finding and to inspire one another to maybe take an idea and then adapt it to our local uh, constructs, I think is cannot be you know, understated how important that is. One of the things, of course, that we're excited about and why we have chosen London as one of the cities to visit is, of course, the ultra low emission zone, which we're keen to learn about. We have been uh, piloting at Lacey a number of zero emission delivery zone and zero emission delivery pilots uh, with the idea of starting on a little bit easier uh, side of things with the delivery and then moving forward, hopefully, on a more comprehensive uh, zero emission zone concept uh, with our partners in the city and in the region. Uh, so that's, you know, I think those are some of the ways that just learnings can be shared uh, with one another very productively. Wonderful and great, great to hear you'll be visiting London. Deputy Mayor, over to you. Well, I mean, we, you know, LA is a very international city. We have uh, over 90 consulates here um, and, and a lot of, uh, in many, um, in, in many case, cases, the, the biggest populations outside of a particular country are here in Los Angeles. So those, um, those commercial, uh, cultural and familial ties 
uh, really go all over the world and uh, and really help to enrich Los Angeles um, as you know as a city and as a place people want uh, want to come to whether to visit or to or to live. Um, you know, so when, when it comes, it comes to the Olympics, Olympics specifically, specifically yeah, we are looking. Uh, and I see Naomi in the in our, the audience, uh, who uh, is on loan to the mayor's office from the Tokyo Metropolitan Government, uh, helping us with Olympics uh, preparation. And for agents to talk a little bit uh, with you and and your folks, the uh, folks visiting from uh, the UK government about uh, about Olympics uh, preparation. So uh, we really value those those insights. Uh, I was reminded. Uh, the, coming, coming over, over here, here about, about uh, I, I was in, in uh, when I worked, worked for the U.S. federal, federal government, government, I was in, in Rio in 2012, in 2012 for an international conference, conference and we were standing out in this dirt lot, lot and they said, that this is the Olympic village for 2016. Oh boy. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> fortunately, I don't think we're going to have that particular problem in Los Angeles, but really uh, learning. And then the last thing I'd say, we've talked a lot about uh, the port. Uh, and the, um, it is the, the ports of Long, Los Angeles and Long Beach, the largest uh, port complex in the U.S. Forty over forty percent of the goods, containerized goods, come into the U.S. come in through the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach. And so, um, you're really looking at the uh, at Goods movement from where it's where it starts uh, often uh, in the uh, across the Pacific. Uh, so one thing uh, we've been working on uh, with with other uh, with our partners on the other side of the Pacific are um, what are called green shipping corridors. So uh, looking uh, for opportunities to reduce emissions uh, throughout the uh, goods movement cycle, uh, starting uh, with the ships. So. Uh, uh, so an agreement with uh, the port of uh, with the port of Shanghai, uh, uh, Singapore, uh, several, several Japanese, Japanese ports, uh, uh, to work together uh, to zero, uh, to create zero emission uh, shipping corridor across the Pacific. That sounds great. And um, Mike, over to you. Sure. Ditto to everything that's already been said. Um, learning and, and and innovation takes so many different forms that you can't help but want to absorb. You know what has been learned. You know we often think of ourselves as on the front lines and kind of pushing to new places in California, and that is true. But when it comes to electrified transportation, we're we you know there are many who have stepped you know a lot further out than we have thus far. And you're the first one out. You do some great things, but you also learn some things along the way. And so the more that we can exchange those ideas, the better. I'll also add that you know talked a lot about this through the lens of Southern California Edison the utility. But we are um, we have a holding company called Edison International, and on the other side of the holding company's holdings, we have affiliates who are. Um, international, international in nature, nature and are doing, are doing things, things in energy management and electrification, electrification of transportation, transportation and buildings for which we, we find tremendous value in the learning of what is taking place globally um, because, um, because our electric, electric system, system, while it has, has some, some unique uh, aspects to it, also has ways in which it's going through an upgrading process to catch up to the ways that other utilities have operated and have learned to manage uh, electricity demand. I think a big part of this transition too is how we manage the way that electricity is flowing on the system because when we do that, we can actually save the ability to have to build and build and build and, and add costs when we can very smartly control and address the load that's being used on the system. So those are some really valuable learnings for us. Thank you. So we have a couple of minutes uh, left of the panel before we move to questions. So I'll ask each of you, is there anything you're really excited about uh, over the next few years in terms of that cleaner energy transition? Michelle? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's hard to pick just one thing. I'm excited about many things, but I think just touching on some of the earlier conversations, um, uh, jobs are one of the things that I'm excited about. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention coming from the incubator, because a lot of our work is also about uh, working with our public and private sector partners to identify where there are potential job streams out there that um, we could help to fill some of the training needs for, and then help to ensure that folks from low-income communities, communities of color, are able to access the training and the knowledge to be able to participate and benefit from being a part of and having a good career in the clean energy and zero emission transportation field. 
Um, I know there was a remark earlier about the article today that it came out around the um, fact that so often chargers are offline. And I just I experienced that myself. It is a very real challenge in state. And I'll just you know, kind of share one anecdote of one of our many startup companies. And I know there's some here today in the room, but one of our companies that is addressing that very challenge uh, there's a company called Charger Help that, in fact, uh, was born out of work with Lacey on our workforce development program. We said, you know, there's really got to be training that can be done for uh, maintaining and repairing chargers because so often the chargers are not offline because of an engineer has a problem, but because of a software problem. And there's, you know, got to be ways to address that. And can we put together a really good solid training that can help fit that need, train folks? who can sort of form a core of people who could be on call to go out and address wind chargers are offline. And we were so lucky to connect with Camille Terry and Yvette Ellis, two fantastically brilliant women from South LA who decided to create Charger Help, which is entirely that. They are training up the workforce of the future to go out and maintain and repair charging infrastructure. And in just a few minutes, they have raised a ton of money. They are now active in I think 14 states, maybe more and really doing this great work and bringing to everyone's attention this problem of chargers being offline and the importance of um, incorporating into policy now at the federal level that when grants are given for the deployment of charging infrastructure that there also needs to be funding put towards the maintenance and repair and thinking about that longer term operation of the chargers. So a long answer, but I guess just a way, an example to bring to life the real excitement is around uh, employing folks in the clean tech and clean energy sectors. That was a, a great example as well. What an innovative company. Deputy to Mayor, over to you. Yeah, I think uh, uh, things, things that, that I'm excited about, about well, I'll, 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 I'll try not to be too nerdy, nerdy about, uh, about, about these things, things but, but you know, know, one of the things, things um, you know, you know that, that sort of underlies this uh, transition, transition on, on uh, to, clean to clean transportation, transportation is, is cleaning up our energy grid. So, so, you know, we have a goal to get to 100% clean energy uh, on our grid by 2035. The state's goal is 2045. And just the opportunity that's really unlocks uh, for our transportation system, for our system things, uh, for our industry, uh, really uh, across the board. And to really, uh, you know, finally, um, finally tackle uh, our smog problem. Um, um, all, all of these uh, tied, tied together. together. And, and then, you know, I think, you know, we were excited, were excited to host the Olympics. Olympics. We might we be slightly might be terrified, terrified, but, um, but, um, but mostly excited. excited. Uh, uh, but, but again, yeah, it's just a, a huge opportunity, opportunity. Um, not, not just to showcase Los Angeles to the world, but really think about how we how we create a legacy and one around sustainability. Which uh, you know we uh, we are still benefiting from the legacy of the '84 games, and can we do the same thing uh, with these with these games and and really focus on sustainability? Yeah, I, there there are so many avenues to be be about. Um, I could share the ones that have already been mentioned. I think the other piece of this too is the the excitement that I have behind. What, what the, the generations, generations coming along and behind, behind us and, and with us are with us push beyond what we can even fathom right now. The degree of change that I see happening and taking place across our economy, in our state, in our world, uh, when it comes to adoption, we've been talking about 25% of new vehicles being electric five years ago. I don't know. I think that's a little crazy. Um, you know, but it's happening. And so to see the pace of change starting to pick up and probably exceed some of our expectations, that is so exciting. The, the piece that comes with it that is, is daunting and worrying and challenging is how can we keep up with it so that we don't stall with momentum? And that brings some excitement in that as you unlock each of the solutions, as we find things and do things we've never done before, like I talked about mobile batteries coming out to these locations, and we solve that problem and say, somebody sees this, they stop it, now they get to move forward and they become that messenger of where this is going. That kind of change that just ripples because people want it, not because they're being told to do it. It's so invigorating. And so what I get excited about is excited that change happening now and what I can't possibly fathom, but I know will be coming next to help us achieve and exceed those goals. 
an uplifting note to end on uh, for all of you in terms of the excitement um, ahead. So thank you uh, for your answers, really appreciated your insights. And I'd now like to open up the um, audience participation and hear from you on any questions that you might have. I will come with the mic when might be. Hi, my name is Tasha Higgins. I'm from Caltrans, and thank you for the invitation. I, it was an honor and a, a pleasure to hear your <laughs> investment in your speech. Um, a couple of you mentioned virtual um, grid, virtual substation. I wasn't quite sure. Mike, could you elaborate on what that is? Sure. So virtual power plant is, is what you heard. And Michelle, please feel free to add on because of all the great work Lacey is doing here. Um, and, you know, likewise for, for how DWP is thinking about it in the city. But the, the concept of a virtual power plan is sort of at a local and distributed level. How do you deploy resources in a way that they are more visible in an aggregated fashion and can react and behave in certain ways that are more centrally identified? And what that does is it allows you to manage what you might other have, otherwise have as demands on your system that a power plant would have otherwise served, right? A, a, a distant resource. So a combination of things like rooftop solar, load control in the home, battery systems that are that are present, and you kind of tie them all together through a common technology platform. When you do that, deploy them at scale in certain areas, you can offset the need for other kinds of grid investment to meet a localized need. And, and it's, it's very, very flexible. flexible. So, so when you have that, that, that control, the idea is you can ramp things up and down in ways that, that um, again, kind of give that benefit to the system. system. So that's, that's the notion of kind of a virtual, virtual power plant. plant. It's, you know, you can, can, it can be combined, combined with cars, the, car, the, car, the, the, the rooftop, rooftop system, the battery system, system and so forth, forth low control in the house, your nest system, all of those pieces working together. Michelle, anything you want to add on that? So glad you answered the question. At the risk of like going down the the rabbit hole, uh, you know, I think, I think, you know, we're seeing the technology now really coming um, to help to enable that. So even, you know, we've got, um, you know, the major auto manufacturers are selling, uh, you know, the yeah, electric uh, E150 uh, pickup truck that is bi-directional that you can, you know, run your whatever off of it. Um, but, you know, we've been, uh, so DWP has been working with, for example, with the school district and it has a, a rate now to help, um, help uh, you know, facilitate um, kind of bi-directional charging. So being able to feed the grid off of um, um, all the little batteries that are going to be running around the, the city. So there's a lot that technology is helping to enable um, that wasn't really available just a few years ago. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Good afternoon. I'm Salika Josiah Talbot. Um, this past year, I led a group of 10 women to Paris um, in preparation for the Paris Olympics to look, learn, lead, find out what they're doing, bring it back to LA, and how can we improve things here in Los Angeles. There are a ton of things that we be learning from that trip, but two things that stand out to me that I hope that um, you can each address. One is, um, between the region and the city and the Olympic Committee and various organizations, there was no transparency and sometimes very little interaction or really clear understanding of what one agency to the next was doing. And secondly, um, every time we went to a new location, we would ask them what they were doing with respect to preparation for Wi-Fi and broadband access. And each one said, I hope the other one is working on that. Um, can you address any preparations or plans for those things with respect to um, to LA 28? I think uh, I can start. Uh, so um, we have uh, the city of Los Angeles as the as the host city has an agreement with LA 28 on sort of how we're going to work together, um, which is also includes a number of um, kind of regional councils. To help uh, make sure that the region is prepared, because as Mike said, this is a regional a regional game. So, um, for example, uh, GWP is is convening a games energy council that are bringing in all the energy providers, uh, so the regulators and uh, state and federal government. There's a games mobility council really looking at uh, making sure that we're all working together to meet the mobility needs. 
uh, uh, you know, uh, efforts around workforce uh, and other other things. And I don't know on the Wi-Fi now. You may know the answer to that. Uh, if that if that's addressed in the games agreement, you know. No, I guess. We'll have to get back to you on that one, but it's a good note and I appreciate the feedback and we'll make sure we know the answer to that. Thanks. Hi, I'm Tasha Harvey. Thank you so much for the invite and this great discussion and panel. I work for Arup. Um, several of my colleagues are here tonight and I've had the pleasure of working with SoCal Edison, LADWP and UKPN throughout my career in the different locations I've been based. And, and I've, I've heard a lot about, about electrification, electrification for our zero emission, emission transportation plan. plan. I, I wonder if we could hear from the panelists if, if there's, there's any plans that include hydrogen, hydrogen whether that's, that's for transport or other parts, parts of the grid implementation. And, and I, think I think there's, there's probably some learning points from the UK in their great, great momentum and build up to hydrogen um, transmission throughout, throughout the country that, that we could all be learning from. So I'd love to hear on those points. Thank you. Um, sure. So, so yeah, yeah, I think I think we view hydrogen as as um, you know part of a portfolio of solutions. Uh, so um, the uh, the Inflation Reduction Act uh, included uh, uh, but uh, eight billion dollars for a set of hydrogen hubs. I'm really trying to develop the hydrogen market in the U.S. Uh, so uh, we are uh, part. You guys are too, right? Uh, part, part of the, the uh, California, California statewide, statewide uh, hydrogen uh, hub called Arches, which I can never remember what it's at. Alliance for Renewable Clean Hydrogen Energy System. I think that's close. Uh, so, uh, but in, so the things that the city is looking at is really um, looking at, at uh, the power grid and so opportunities in power grid to use green hydrogen, so hydrogen derived from renewable energy uh, sources to um, help uh, uh, our grid, uh, but also uh, the Port of Los Angeles as well, looking at um, cargo handling equipment and uh, initially mobile fueling, maybe trucks. So I think for the port, um, and in the good movement sector, really electrify everything you can electrify and hydrogen, uh, green hydrogen, hydrogen made from renewable energy sources uh, for the rest. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And, and um, just kind of thinking about the landscape. So we're an electric only utility. We won't be um, transforming any part of our system directly for hydrogen delivery. But to, to Nancy's point, there's a really important uh, role for uh, clean electricity in the conversion of hydrogen, and we see hydrogen as a really important part of that solution set that I mentioned. When we look out to 2045, um, for those those hard to electrify, uh, um, you know, applications, and that includes probably a good deal of, of heavy duty transportation. There's a there's a mix there where you have some electric solutions for certain types, but longer haul, especially. Uh, it's going to be really important. And then for some of the other uh, applications as well. So very much see it as part of the solution. Hello, uh, my name is Francis Polara, and I was, uh, I was interested to know you talked a lot about electrification infrastructure. Uh, how do you think about decentralizing that demand in community owned or other ways in which we can kind of mitigate the, uh, the demand and uh, the kinetic energy requirement from plants that you were talking about with uh, virtual plants. Yeah, absolutely. So that's another component of the puzzle is both the the rooftop solar set, but then you've got right a number of communities where um, you know you don't own properties or a direct roof. Top solar solution might not be the one, so a community solar or other community energy source might be very important there. You do have land and space challenges when you're dealing with this, so you have to make sure you can find it uh, sited in, in certain areas. But we actually have uh, programs today where we provide a certain type of incentive and rate structure for any community solar programs or community renewable energy programs. In some cases, we actually acquire the power um, and deliver it for that, that particular community based on things we're already doing in the renewable portfolio. Um, but absolutely, the, the, the degree of need when we think about how the system is going to grow has to involve you know, more centralized power and more decentralized power. And we see you know, substantial growth in each of those areas. And part of that is how do we help make that happen in a way that 
um, ensures the cost picture for it is handled appropriately and doesn't become too much of an offset elsewhere in the system. So all that has to be taken into account, but absolutely see it as a as part of this, the, the big picture. Hi, my name is Whitney Pitkanen. I work for XPRIDE. To piggyback on that um, question just we, that we just had, are you seeing any other breakthrough technologies aside from a local solar and storage or virtual power plant that can expedite transmission and distribution um, outside of the traditional infrastructure or in conjunction with it? There. Similarly, right, this is such an interesting, fast-moving space, and if I had some of my colleagues who, we actually have a team that does growth and innovation uh, evaluation of the system that is constantly uh, coming up with, with uh, different avenues where we're seeing some of these opportunities. There certainly are ways in which the system itself can be better managed, the, the, the kinds of technology you want to put on there to help isolate components of the system. You know, today when we have to deal with, you know, a particular um, challenge or, or need for a, a repair, sometimes that can affect a much larger part of the system than it otherwise might lead to. Or when you get to a place like Nancy was talking about where you've got more two-way flow of power being pushed back in from central locations, you want the system to be able to route that in a way that really makes the best use of it. So that then you're saying, yeah, I am efficiently getting everything out of the localized resources before I build on top for the, the outward looking in. Um, we have to pair that with the resiliency picture. So I think what I get most excited about is, uh, is energy storage at a large kind of utility scale, also local, but at a large, but at like paired at a substation, uh, the, the ability, ability to, to to store the power that we generate so robustly during the middle of the day today and isn't fully accounted for and to be able to redispatch that and use it in other conditions in a super clean way i'm very excited about it we're actually in the midst right now of deploying three large-scale batteries um, across our services territory that are you know going to be the equivalent uh, when you put them all together of you know having put online a very significant power station so, so that's, that's happening locally, and it allows us to add to the resiliency of particular areas of our grid. So I think that is going to be a big part of where this is all going to go. Yeah, and the one thing that I add is, you know, I, 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 both, I know for both uh, DWP and, and Southern California Edison, all this electrification is going to add to load. And that means, you know, we need the, uh, the grid that can support that additional load. And, and you know, know, when you, you look, look at, at the, the city of Los, Los Angeles, Angeles and you're bound to the city of Los Angeles, you know, you know where, where are we going to put all that stuff? stuff? Uh, uh, and so, so how, how do we better utilize, utilize um, you know, know, automation, automation AI, AI, other, other things, things uh, what do we call oh, non, non wires non alternatives, alternatives, something like that, that uh, you know, to to make sure that we're using that, all that equipment as efficiently, effectively as possible, because if we have to go out and you know, you know, acquire, acquire uh, places, places to put uh, a lot, a lot uh, more uh, distribution, distribution stations, stations, receiving stations, stations and, and uh, you know, know all of that, that uh, distribution, distribution infrastructure. That's hard to do in a fully built out city like like Los Angeles. So, uh, so all of that um, kind of innovation and technology to make the system uh, the grid more reliable. Uh, inherently more reliable, I think, is going to be incredibly important as load continues to grow. We could use some innovation with my technology. Um, I, I had to jump in here because, of course, from Lacey's perspective, it's a resounding yes that we are seeing exciting innovations and continuing to meet great founders who have new ideas that they are testing in this space. I think one of the things, and, and Mike alluded to this, I think that we're gonna be seeing more and more of going forward is that it's really, um, there's gonna be an interesting and needed focus on how technologies work together. So whereas, you know, maybe 10 years ago, we were looking at the development of individualized technologies. Now it's a lot about how we pair things to be more powerful and robust and create a resilient system. So, you know, the dream, or it's not even a dream, it is happening now, right, of, of pairing um, say an EV charger with solar power and battery storage so that in the event of an emergency that you could, you know, utilize the, the battery storage um, 
thinking about connecting our vehicles to our grid or to buildings to serve as that backup generator, again, in those emergency situations, thinking about in particular school buses as a great source potentially of vehicle to grid technologies when school buses are so often not utilized during the summer, the sunniest part of the year, they could be these great, great these mobile batteries um, that we could be utilizing. So I think it's about how we're bringing together a variety of technologies, even as we're fostering some of these great new innovative ideas that are just coming up now. Thank you. Um, thank you uh, to our wonderful panelists uh, for your expertise and your insights. Thank you to the LA World Affairs Council for streaming this out, our first live stream from the British residents. So thank you uh, for that. And thank you to everyone in the room and online for joining us. Um, we really appreciate it and we hope to do it again with you soon. Thanks so much. Yes, just want to echo Consul General Cloak's comments and say thank you so much to our panelists and to Consul General Cloak for an incredibly interesting and future focused conversation. And we want to thank our partners again at the British Consulate General for organizing a great conversation today. For those of you joining us online, we hope to see you at one of our upcoming programs. Actually, tomorrow, January 25th, we host author Steve Singh for a conversation on his new book, which is titled The Political Thought of Xi Jinping. The discussion will be moderated by Alex Wong of the UCLA School of Law. And then next Thursday, February 1st, join us for the February edition of the Dan Schneider Political Report. Dan's going to be covering Biden, Trump, or dot, 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 the case for a fourth political party. So we hope that you will join us for one of those programs and check out our website for upcoming uh, programs in February and March. Thank you. Mm -hmm.